Do you want to practice astrology in a more accurate and concrete way that allows you to give more powerful readings to your astrological clients? Then join us for our upcoming Uranian Astrology for Practicing Astrologers Immersion, which begins this January 30th, 2024. You can find out more information by checking out the link down below in the description box. Hey there everyone, Michael A. Bryan here from the Oracular School of Astrology with yet another question and answer segment where practicing astrologers bring me their questions and I provide them answers based on my astrological practice. Well, I have a question about solar return charts. So in the solar return, we relocate the solar return ascendant into the natal chart and that is the house that's rising that year. And I have for some reason naturally been doing the same thing with the solar return lord of the four first like giving it the same weight like that's also rising but then i've been encountering some places where that gets really sticky for example if you have the seventh house rising but then solar return lord one is in the 11th house and so you get these really different stories and i don't know how to approach it this question has to do with soul returns which is something that we practice at the Oraculo School of Astrology. There's a video actually on YouTube in which I explain everything you could possibly want to know about soul returns, but I'm going to take it down. And the reason I'm going to take it down is because we all have our vices in life. Vanity is my vice. And one, I don't like the camera quality. Two, I don't like the audio quality. Three, the sun was shining in my face. And four, my hair did not look good. So I'm going to delete that YouTube video and recreate that video at some point in the future. So watch it while you still can. It's called Soul Return something something. Everything you need to know about Soul Returns. Anyway, a technique that we do at the Oracular School of Astrology where we place the Soul Return Ascendant in the natal chart. Now, this caller used the term relocate the soul return ascendant. And the reason why I don't like to use that word relocate the soul return ascendant is because it kind of plants the seed of relocation in our minds or in the minds of people who don't know what we're talking about. And it can possibly cause people to think that we should be relocating our soul returns, which is something we don't do at the Oraculos School of Astrology. At Oraculos, we use the birth location for the soul return, period. We've never relocated the soul return since Oraculos was first opened in the year 2015. And, well, at the time it was called something else. But we've never relocated solar returns since Oraculos was first opened in the year 2015, and we never will. I haven't practiced all of the astrology I'll practice in my entire life, but I'm pretty positive that I never will relocate the solar return chart to a location where I am on my birthday as opposed to my birth location, because I've seen that create all sorts of neurotic behavior amongst astrologers. It's silly. So no, we do not relocate the soul return ascendant. If you were born in Timbuktu, your soul return is going to be cast for Timbuktu until the day you die and potentially reincarnate. And at that point, when you reincarnate, then maybe we'll put your soul return ascendant for the new place where you're born at. Not maybe, we will, because we only use the natal location for soul returns. Now, to the question that was asked, this brings up a very interesting point. In, <laughs> in astrology, at the moment, we have this Hellenistic astrology movement that's going on, and it's very strong. Everybody and their grandmother is a Hellenistic astrologer, so help me God. Every single person uses whole sign houses, and they don't even know why they use whole sign houses. They just use whole sign houses because it happens to be the thing that's trending at this moment. So help me, Jesus. So everybody wants to be a Hellenistic astrologer, and nobody knows why. In my personal opinion, I'm not the only astrological opinion in the universe. That is an opinion I hold. And within this Hellenistic astrology revival, there is this notion of using perfections. Because perfections are a type of classical astrological timing technique that we find amongst ancient astrologers. I don't personally use perfections. I know astrologers who swear by perfections, 
one astrologer who I really, really love, and I think that everybody should buy her book on fertility astrology. Her name is Nicola Smuts Alsop, and Nikki uses perfections. I think Nicola is amazing in everything she does as far as fertility astrology is concerned, and I think she is hands down the best fertility astrologer in the West. So if you don't currently have Nikki's book, you should go and get Nikki's book because I think that she's incredible. And she uses perfections. And we had a debate about this. It wasn't actually a debate because whenever I choose to give somebody my money to learn from them, I don't argue with them. I sit down and I listen to what they have to say. I learn what they have to say and I soak it up because only then can I make decisions within myself regarding what I'm going to do with that information. The point is, if you're going to pay somebody to learn something from them, you listen to what they have to say. So I actually didn't have an argument with Nikki about this. I just accepted that she used perfections. But within this perfection worldview, whenever a person using that type of astrology says that I'm in a 12th house year, or I'm in a third house perfection year, it means something very different from what we refer to when we say that we're having a 12th house year at the Oracular School of Astrology. When we say that somebody is having a 12th house year, we mean that the soul return ascendant is located within their natal 12th house. And therefore, they have their natal 12th house rising within the soul return chart. That, for me, seems a little bit more organic, but once again, who am I? So the point of the matter is, if you have the solar return ascendant landing within a particular house within your natal chart, then that house is going to be the house that is strongly highlighted for you within that specific year. The ruler of the soul return ascendant is also going to carry a similar function. In the example that we were given, this caller asked, what should we do if we have the soul return ascendant terrestrially located in the seventh house, for example, and the ruler of the soul return ascendant terrestrially located within our natal 11th house? Undoubtedly, the reason why this very astute caller asks this question is because when we have our natal 7th house rising within a soul return year, that's considered to be one of the most challenging things that can possibly manifest within the life of a person. And if you want to know all about soul returns, I made an entire soul return masterclass series that's available to be purchased on our website at oraculosastrology.com. And if you want to specifically go to our web store, it is learn.oraculosastrology.com. Everything you could possibly want to know about what it means to have your soul return ascendant in a particular house of your natal chart, you will find it in that web series. But when you have the soul return ascendant in the seventh house, Jean-Baptiste Morin du Villefranche, who was a French astrologer in the 17th century, said that it is as if the entire sky has turned upside down for you, which can't be thought of as a good thing. If you have the whole sky turned upside down from where it was when you were born, then chances are you're going to have a very challenging year. And this is the truth if you have any of these three topsy-turvy houses rising within a soul return chart. If you have the soul return ascendant in your sixth house, you're going to have a stressful year. You're probably going to get sick. If you have the soul return ascendant rising in your seventh house, you're going to have a stressful year, period. It's just going to be stressful because the entire sky has turned upside down on its head in relationship to you. If you have the soul return ascendant landing in your natal eighth house, it's going to be a stressful year. You're probably going to lose your job. You're probably going to lose your house, but you're going to go through a symbolic death process in which you have to let go of something that you're very, very close to. So this is true for any of these houses, six, seven, or eight. Now, with the seventh house, there is an addendum. Because when we have the seventh house rising, if you naturally have a good seventh house, you have Jupiter and Pisces in the seventh house, you have Venus and Pisces in the seventh house, you have a seventh house that's just living la vida loca, then if you have the seventh house rising in a soul return year, chances are it represents a year when you're going to get married, and chances are it represents a year when you're going to have a very positive event unfold in relationship to your seventh house, as well as in relationship 
Two, with the planets within your natal seventh house rule, especially if the soul return ascendant is very close to being in the conjunction with any of those positive planets in your seventh house. However, if you have the seventh house rising and you have Mars in the seventh house, then chances are you're probably going to end up in a lawsuit, you're probably going to get divorced, you're probably going to go through any sort of Martian warlike experience between you and your seventh house partners, whether you're married to those people or whether you are in legal contentions with those people. So there's a lot to say. And while we could go through all of the planets in the seventh, we won't. The point is, there are certain planets who have more of an analogous relationship with the 7th house, and there are certain planets that don't really have an analogous relationship to the 7th house. Venus has an analogous relationship with the 7th house because the 7th house is a house of marriage. Mars has an analogous relationship with the 7th house because the 7th house is a very litigious house. It's a house of litigation and lawsuits. Therefore, both Venus and Mars do have a relationship with the 7th house. However, we technically only want the Venus to be there because chances are the Mars in the 7th creates problems that we would like to avoid in this lifetime. So that's what it means to have the soul return ascendant in your natal 7th house. It's a bad thing because the whole sky is turned upside down and it can only be a good thing if you have a good seventh house to begin with. Now, if you have that going on as well as the ruler of the soul return chart in another house, say the 11th house, the same thing that you would do in the natal chart is the same thing that you would do in this case. The reality is that we already do this as astrologers. We already talk about the ascendant being in one condition and the ruler of the ascendant being elsewhere in the chart, probably in another condition. So this isn't actually heavy lifting. The heavy lifting is actually doing enough practice until this becomes second nature to us. So if I have the seventh house rising and I have a bad seventh house, or maybe I don't have any planets in my seventh house at all, which would still make it bad because it's the seventh house rising from my natal chart in my soul return chart, then it's going to be a challenging year. If I have the ruler of the soul return ascendant landing in my natal 11th house, it's going to be a very challenging year because I have the seventh house rising, but I'm also going to feel very hopeful about this year because I am physically placed in my 11th house. Now, if I'm physically placed in my 11th house and I'm being squared by my natal Saturn or squared by the soul return Saturn, then chances are I'm going to be hopeful that this year is going to turn around positively for me. However, those hopes are going to manifest as ashes in my mouth because being squared by my natal Saturn or the soul return Saturn says, guess what, buddy? It's just going to be a difficult year. If I have the rule of my soul return ascendant, which is technically in my natal seventh house, but the ruler of that soul return ascendant is in my natal 11th house and that planet is receiving a positive aspect, a wonderful trine from my natal Jupiter or a wonderful trine from the soul return Jupiter, then the year is still going to suck. However, we're going to be supported by people within our environment. We're going to be lifted out of our suffering somewhat. Therefore, if everybody else catches a particular disease and dies around us, we'll catch the disease and we'll probably only lose our big toe. Or something which is still considerable because big toes are important but the reality is we'll still live to tell the tale whereas other people who don't have that good situation going on in their charts probably won't if you have the seventh house rising and you have a good seventh house and you have the ruler of your soul return ascendant in the 11th house then chances are you're getting married because marriage is judged very often from the seventh house but also from the 11th house sometimes from a predictive astrology perspective because very often the 11th house is representing the fulfillment of our desires and very often in a year when we are getting married we oftentimes do find the ruler of the soul return ascendant landing in either the soul return 11th house or the natal 11th house because marriage can often represent people attaining all of their hopes and dreams within that specific year. So that's how I would judge it if you have a good seventh house, but you also have the information for how I would judge it if you have a bad seventh house. 
and good and bad are completely okay words to use in astrology. And the moral of the story is that we just need to practice more astrology and we need to know that if you have a body of knowledge from one particular branch of astrology that you practice, such as natal astrology, that knowledge should be able to be transferred to your solar return practice. Because natal astrology and solar return astrology aren't really that different. They are tremendously different. But if you understand the technique of how to use a solar return chart and how to interpret a solar return chart, after you get over the initial hurdle of trying to make those two charts sing the same song, everything else that you do is really based on your natal astrology practice. So that's my advice for this caller and we wish her the best of luck in all of her future soul return endeavors. If you've enjoyed today's show, then please remember to hit subscribe down below. I'm currently on a mission to get 12,000 subscribers across all platforms, which includes YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify by the end of November 2023. And it's a tall order, but I'm pretty sure we can do it because we make some really good astrological content here on the Oraculous Podcast. So please remember to hit subscribe down below, hit the notification bell so that you receive notifications of when we come out with these episodes on a daily basis and please share 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 the oraculous podcast with your other astrologically minded friends so that more and more people can know about the amazing work that we're doing over here on the oraculous podcast